But before I start, I do really want to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of, of the land that uh, many of us have had a great uh, privilege to see uh, at such a beautiful time. Those of us who flew yesterday from Brisbane and also drove yesterday afternoon from Longreach, it was just amazing uh, to see this country uh, in such good shape. Um, so, uh, as I say, we always do want to be mindful of the uh, traditional custodians, both uh, past and present. So, first of all, I'm going to outline uh, what, what this boom is all about, what's driving it, um, and looking at the national, regional economic impacts, and also specifically CSG. Now, um, I tend to look at things not just as a sort of a market or type economist. I, I like to look at more the institutional factors because they're just as important as markets. But as many of you would know, uh, commodity prices have increased considerably, uh, but on average about threefold since 2004. And that is what is driving a lot of the investment we're seeing in, uh, in coal and iron ore and also LNG. Um, but it's not just prices alone. There's much more going on here. There are institutional factors. There are tax policies. Um, firstly, it is, I think, the fact that Australia, I, I say in my previous book, Too Much Luck, is really the sweet spot for resource extraction. First world country, with all that great governance, all that certainty, we don't nationalise projects, we don't take them over once they become successful. We uh, have fairly compliant governments that follow the rule of law, but at the same time, we actually have fairly low uh, rates of tax. Um, and if you look at some of our taxes, particularly on iron ore and coal, they're actually lower than those in Brazil and Indonesia. So that is why I think partly Australia is being flooded with investment at the moment. It's not just prices, it's also the fact that we, uh, we have uh, good governance, but we don't charge for it. Unlike Norway, that charges 70% for all <coughs> companies to extract their wealth. Uh, ours is actually more in the low, in the low 30s. Also, we have state governments that I think are really quite weak and they're absolutely addicted to the royalties, which I think have sort of become a form of inducement that, uh, that uh, does greatly influence the decision-making process. And, and finally, the federal government has basically uh, rubber-stamped a lot of these projects um, and has really not stood in the way. Now, this is some um, information from the federal government. It's a survey, that survey they do twice a year. And this shows what I think is just an absolute tsunami of investment that is being um, uh, built around the country right now in, in, in new projects. Um, so you can see actually in 2009, before we brought in the so-called mineral resource rent tax, which was meant to give the Australian citizens a fair share, uh, that the amount of new projects has actually doubled. So that new tax has had no impact whatsoever. Um, you can see the bottom uh, part of the bar, most of it is actually energy. So over 150 or so billion dollars of new projects approved by company boards being built right now, um, about half of that in Queensland through, through coal seam gas um, and, and the rest over in, uh, in Western Australia. So it really is the coal seam gas and the LNG developments that, that are absolutely dominating uh, what, what is going on. And this just shows a bit of a map of where these projects are being built. Uh, you can see the Pilbara, uh, the Northwest Shelf over in Western Australia. Those red dots are projects worth more than $40 million. Uh, but also, so Queensland, and you can see uh, you know, around Gladstone, but also um, um, inland around the Bowen Basin. This would not yet show the Galilee Basin projects uh, because they have not yet been signed off by, by the company boards, uh, or have not yet approved by government as well. As a result of this invest, all of this investment and all this new um, activity, the main imp impact it's having on our macro economy is through the Australian dollar. Um, all of this new investment is doubling what's called the volume, just the sheer volume amount of production, not taking into account the prices. And it's conceivable over the course of this decade that we will more than double uh, our resources sector. So it's already at 15% of GDP. If prices hold up, it, would, it, could, it could easily go to 30. But prices, I think, actually will adjust because new supply is coming on stream all around the world as a result of these high prices. But even if prices come back by half, we will still greatly uh, expand this sector. And uh, so that is really going to be having a, a big impact on the A dollar. And that the A dollar, I think, is, is really going to be driving a lot of the structural change that's going on in our economy. Um, you can see here that uh, with iron ore exports, they've already uh, increased um, tenfold in terms of the, the, the price that we're getting. 
uh, companies are dramatically investing in new production, so that could easily double over this decade. Coal as well, but LNG is actually the one that is, is, is expanding the fastest of all, and, and we're looking at uh, something in the order of a five-fold increase, so from 20 million tonnes to uh, around 100 million tonnes, and if you, um, depending on what happens to prices, that will become like a third pillar of our resources economy. So we'll have coal, iron ore, and LNG being these big um, uh, uh, parts, parts of our export uh, economy. Now, even though the mining sector is only 15% of GDP at the moment, it's actually tripled uh, over the past uh, decade. Um, it's completely dominating the investment. So that um, bar chart I showed earlier with all that new investment coming on, when you look at the investment dollars as a whole around the country, uh, it's, my resources is now 55% of all investment, 70% of building investment. So people in Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane talk about there being a housing shortage. No one's investing in, in construction anymore. Well, the reason why that is is because all the money is flowing into, into resources. And that is, I think, um, uh, making the, uh, the two-speed economy even more um, uh, severe than what it would otherwise be. Now, I think here in regional Australia, you know about floods, and you know that floods are not a good thing. What we, we're all in favour of economic growth. We all like to see the economy continue to tick along. But um, what we're having now is really, I think, a flood of investment into the resources sector because of all those factors I mentioned. Um, and that the investment dollars are finite, and so that means that this is actually then causing a contraction in the non-mining economy. And that's why you hear, despite in these boom times, that people in the major cities, in the non-mining economy, in manufacturing, in retail, and in construction, by the way, sectors that are very labour intensive, are actually having a really hard time because they just haven't got the growth because the, the, uh, the, the investment dollars are just flooding into the resources sector. And as well, we have the public sector contracting at the same time. Now, um, in The Australian, we've been running a series of articles which have been called a Hollow Nation, and I, I, I wrote a few of them. Uh, this is an illustration that was done for one of them, and um, it's, um, the, it was, the artist, I think, captured it quite well, that the, the mining economy is, is, in a sense, sort of cutting into the, the traditional uh, non-mining economy there, represented by the, uh, the uh, Holden Cruise um, made of sand. Um, and I think there are some dangers in all of this. I think there is a risk in becoming too resources dependent. I've worked in third world countries and I've, that's where a lot of my thinking comes from. I've spent time in PNG. I also worked for a number of years in East Timor. And uh, those countries actually do, I think, have better policies to uh, ameliorate some of the, the side effects you can get out of uh, being too resource dependent. Um, but at the moment, we've tripled the resources sector in the space of, uh, well, about eight years, actually. Um, we've actually almost doubled resources as a share of our exports. So before we used to have a sort of a mix, a bit like the balanced portfolio, a bit like the investment portfolio. We all know that with our investment, uh, with our, life, with our superannuation, we like to have a spread, but we're now skewing our export income much more towards resources. So it's gone from 35% to 67% of exports. So we're now very heavily reliant. And given the volume increase and depending on what happens to prices, I think it's conceivable that you could go from to 80 or 90 percent. So we'd be very much dependent on this sector for the the money that we use then to buy foreign goods and services to support our first world standard of living. Um, so there have been a lot of jobs gained as a result of mining boom, and I don't deny that, and I think that's a good thing. Um, but at the same time, you could actually argue because of the effect it's having on the A dollar that that is also um, destroying jobs. And it's led to this notion of what's called the hollowing out, also known as, as Dutch disease. This is what uh, Holland experienced in the 1970s, um, but also generically, some people call it the two-speed economy. Um, now, this graph is, um, really does tell the story quite well, I think. I got this from the Australian Institute, actually, which uh, produced this in a publication. That top line is the non-mining exports as a share of GDP. And that shows that from 1985, we doubled. We floated the currency, we tore down the tariff wall, and we, we grew all these new industries uh, from scratch. So we did industries like tourism, export into education that we never had before, but also our agriculture, our high value um, produce exports, 
um, and even manufacturing, high value manufacturing, went from 8% of GDP to about 15%. So this was a remarkable achievement. And you can see down the bottom that mining is not doing a great deal. There's a little few blips there. One of them was Malcolm Fraser's resources boom, but it's just sort of ticking over at around 5% of GDP. Come the resources boom, you can see that straight away what's happened is the non-mining exports have plummeted. Uh, that, that line just basically tracks the A dollar. The A dollar going from 65, 70 cents to 80 and then to 90 and over over a dollar. And, um, and then that's, um, and then correspondingly you've seen this um, surge in, in um, resource exports. Mining actually, this is the ABS terminology by the way, mining refers both to uh, uh, traditional mining and also resources. So essentially what we've done is we've swapped five percentage points of, it, of GDP in exports, so about 75 billion dollars, for our diversified export base to then becoming more reliant on mining. And um, I don't think that's actually a, a great outcome because we all know that um, that as um, that there is a, a lot of um, good merit in, in economic diversity. Um, in fact, the uh, the Treasury economists in Canberra and, and the Reserve Bank actually think this is wonderful. They think this is Australia doing what it should do, specialising, becoming a resource economy because this is our so-called comparative advantage. And they predict that this resources boom is going to go on for, they say, several decades, meaning 40 or 50 years. But I bet you, are, if you ask any of those economists, what are you doing with your superannuation? If you follow your own advice, surely you'd be putting it all into resource stocks. I'm sure they wouldn't be so silly to do that because they would know that you need to have a diversified economy. Um, now, just um, actually, I do want to skip. Just, just, bit. Uh, just on this issue of diversity though, uh, it is interesting though, despite the advice that the uh, Treasury bureaucrats have been giving, that the politicians have been uh, um, alert to the idea that we do need to maintain some diversity in our economy and that going all out to become a one sector resource economy is not a good thing. So um, Julia Gillard made these comments earlier in the year that uh, she's talking about those other sectors, meaning non-mining and that we continue to have a diversified economy with lots of areas of strength. So it's good that politicians have uh, picked up on this idea that we've been running in the Australian. And also Tony Abbott earlier than that actually has talked about the inherent value of a diversified economy, saying there's a national security case for having a uh, steel industry and that we want to be a country that actually still makes things. So I think it is important that, now some of our politicians are aware of this, although their policies actually aren't doing a great deal to um, to assist in that regard. I want to focus now a bit more on the regional impacts and sort of the impact that it's had in Queensland, particularly in those gas areas. Um, what happens when you have a mining boom in a particular area, it really is a case of insiders and outsiders. If, if you're in some way uh, directly or even directly um, um, attached to the resources sector, then you're doing all right. You probably will be getting paid more because the companies are earning a lot of money. Um, you'll be able to cover the increased cost of, uh, of your rent and other things. But if you're not in any way direct, indirectly related to the resources sector, then the A dollar's gone through the roof, that's cutting your, your export income. Um, it all, the mining sector also drives up the cost of, um, of um, uh, doing business, so higher rent, higher wages. I've interviewed coal seam gas, uh, farmers with coal seam gas wells on their property and they've earned Reasonable money, $60,000 a year, that sounds pretty good. Their wages bill has actually gone up by more than that. So around places like Chinchilla, uh, the, the, the direct cash that they get from the mining company goes out the door and actually doesn't even make up for the increased uh, labour costs. So, and there is obviously no comp compensation uh, for that. Now it's interesting there has been some modelling done on a project that's been proposed for this area, the Waratah Coal China First Model. Um, most uh, environmental impact statements that I've looked at and others like Gavin has looked at many more than me, uh, a lot of the um, analysis is not terribly um, uh, informative about these impacts, but this is one that managed to, make, to get past the keeper because they commissioned an economic analysis on the impact of this single project which actually said that it would the extra pressure it would put on the A dollar would uh, cost 3,000 manufacturing jobs mainly in Queensland. Um, and also in agriculture and tourism um, would cost agriculture and manufacturing activity by 1.3 billion. Higher inflation in the region, business um, would be hit with higher bills for payroll and rent, 
lower housing affordability and that wealth would become less evenly distributed. And it's pretty clear, it's great that Waratah did this modelling, I'm sure it won't be done again, um, but it's pretty clear that these are the sort of impacts that are being experienced in places like Chinchilla and uh, in that south southeast area, Roma and Tara, that uh, are experiencing the, the gas boom. There's also a pretty nasty tourism impact, uh, partly through the A dollar, um, again through the higher cost of doing business. But I was recently in the Hunter Valley, and it's incredible there where their tourism sector is just imploding. I mean, Hunter Valley used to uh, be world famous for its wine, mostly the Chardonnay produced by Rosemount Estate, which is now a coal mine. Um, and uh, that that's tourism sector is just really going out the back door. Uh, because of all the new mines, but all simply also because the mining companies, all the workers they're bringing in, the contractors, are literally soaking up all of the available accommodation. So you can't actually book a room in a lot of those areas. Well, I just want to touch on a bit more thing, a few more things about coal seam gas and its economic impact before I wind up. Um, similar, I think, to what you'd look at in terms of the China First modelling, that you. Uh, do have this very strong, um, very strong demand for labour. Although I'd actually add that the demand for labour is actually very much uh, uh, relating to the construction phase that we're now seeing. Uh, it's very labour intensive, as you know. You've seen people all around the place uh, building uh, uh, wells and pipelines, laying pipelines. It's very labour intensive. That labour demand, I think, will will ease off when the um, construction phase is over, but then you'll still actually have the high dollar through the additional export income that, uh, that will be flowing. Um, and the other impact on coal seam gas, which I think is, is quite uh, interesting, and it's one that's been talked about a little bit, in fact an AGL has been one of the few companies raising this, is, is just the impact of higher prices. Um, AGL's chief executive Michael Fraser was interviewed on uh, Inside Business uh, late last year and he made these, these comments about where um, prices were heading. And he was saying that, in fact, um, that prices have been you know, around the $4 a, a gigajoule, and that he's convinced that uh, with the pri pricing, new pricing regime as a result of export gas, which, it, which is uh, facing higher prices, um, can, can achieve higher prices, that this could go to six to, or eight, and I um, even heard people talking this even go as high as 14. So anyone who's using gas for their uh, household heating and cooking and also for their business is going to face really considerable increased costs as a result of this new industry because all of that uh, export, um, all of that gas is being, um, what Michael Fraser actually said, was quoted in the paper only yesterday, he referred to it as being, uh, as hoovering up. That, uh, that the, um, it's like a giant vacuum cleaner that's hoovering up all of the gas that it can get its hands on. So if you think about this as an industry, uh, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the risks because that's not my area of expertise. Gavin has done that. Um, although I might just touch on some interesting documents I got hold of which are in my previous book. Um, but um, I think this is an industry that, um, that does have a lot of risks in terms of water um, and then will actually impose some, some negative regional impacts on, on economies directly affected. There will be some benefits, but there will obviously also be costs. But I think this impact on gas prices is something that, I mean, this is an issue for the companies. I mean, the companies are free to do what they want. It's a market economy. I think there's, a, there's an issue here for government to deal with this so that we perhaps think about quarantining some of our gas for our own uh, domestic needs. Um, and uh, the, although the flip side of this, I should add, is that in fact, um, because of the, we, there is now talk of a gas glut. So we may actually find that the market does actually come to the rescue and that all this gas that's coming out of the US will um, mean that these plans to increase prices uh, are not, are not realised. So that, that is, uh, that's a possibility. But as I say, the intention at the moment is to actually link the, the domestic and the export markets, and that is most likely going to uh, mean considerably higher um, costs for, um, for business and households. Um, just to finish off, I just want to talk a bit about policy reform. I've got a few slides on CSG, but I actually, um, I might leave them out because as I say, that's not really my forte. 
Um, I argue in my book that we really do need some much stronger policy to manage this mining boom. Uh, we do need to think about higher taxation. At the heart of it, as I say, is we're a first world country, but we're not charging the resource companies for the benefit of our democracy and the, for the benefit of our governance that they're, that they're exploiting, that they can come here and quite happily and safely do business without the, any threat of uh, things going all right. And uh, I think we need to have a debate about that. I'm not sure if it will happen given what happened to Kevin Rudd. And that what we should be doing as well is um, we should be managing this boom much better and do what countries in Norway and Chile do, that uh, they actually have been setting up these stabilisation funds. So they collect extra revenue and they put a lot of that money offshore into investment funds so they save for a rainy day for when the boom ends. Um, Chile, for example, it quadrupled the size of its um, stabilisation fund, also known as the rainy day fund. And, um, and um, so we got through the GFC without going into debt because it saved $20 billion. We spent um, about $300 billion of windfall revenue received in the last three years of, of John Howard's rule. Um, all gone, all spent on middle class welfare and tax cuts, uh, added to inflation and pushed up interest rates. And, um, and then the Labor came in, the GFC happened, and we had to go into debt to the tune of $107 billion, which we're going to be paying off for the next decade. It's a crazy way to run your economy, I think. But as well, what we could be doing by moderating this boom with higher taxation, saving the money, we would put some downward pressure on interest rates, oh, I'm sorry, on the A dollar, which would mean that you can have your resources boom without really uh, crunching the rest of your economy, which I think would be a good thing in maintaining that sort of economic um, diversity. The other thing I talk about, I'm going into a lot more detail in my new book, is really the regulatory model we have. Uh, there's a lot of talk about all the conditions that are put on these projects when they're approved, and that's true. But uh, I think, as Andrew made the point earlier, about the, the capacity of the government to actually keep on top of this is really quite weak, and it's being undermined by the loss of a lot of talented people uh, who, are, who are leaving the public sector for the better salaries, and I don't blame them for that. I think what we should do is actually we should build up those institutions, pay people market salaries, and so that we can have the sort of governance that, that we deserve as a, as a first world country over these resources. Um, and I think we need to start thinking about stronger and more independent approval because basically the, uh, the politicians are just hooked on the revenues. When they approve a project, they get their little calculators out and they say 12.5% of that, of that pr pr production, we can build three hospitals in marginal electorates. That is what they're doing. And it's, it's, it, I think it's pretty sickening the way that state governments are, are running this. And I actually think we really should start moving away from royalties and shift towards profit-based taxes because royalties have basically become an inducement and, and they're an incentive for bad policy. And uh, also talk about the need for new institutional reform. So I'm going to leave it there. I've got some slides on CSG which I might go into if people are interested, but uh, I'll take questions. And I finished three minutes early. Yeah.